um, well, this is our data. And so students get to say, hey, look at me. They get to see and understand the data through these anonymous surveys. So let's go to the next uh, slide. And what we can do through our surveys and many other tools, but the surveys are the most unique, because I don't know anybody else in the country who's doing this, is we learned how to do basic descriptive statistics, also how to do this really difficult art of sifting through um, observational data and seeing what's a cause and what's a confounder, what's a working variable. It's a very difficult thing to do that we spend a lot of time trying to get a handle on because it's so important. And the last thing that we're able to do this is really enormously fun and very, uh, we're very privileged to do this through the use of uh, our software, our randomized surveys, is that we can actually design experiments and conduct them on ourselves and discover things. So I'll show you how we do each one of these things. And first of all, at the, we give these surveys. They're anonymous, and the most, the coolest thing about them is that this course management system we use on Kappa cannot, can tell whether you submitted the survey but they can't tell who submitted what. There's no way that I can know which submissions belong to which person. So uh, everybody's protected, and since it's our own data that we're analyzing, we have a stake in it. And it's so interesting. You can find out all sorts of stuff, and it's fun. So here's just the first survey that we, on the first day of class, we take this at home on, uh, online. And here's a bunch of questions, and since there's a bunch of mothers and fathers in the audience, let's focus on these two. <laughs> how old is your mom, and how old is your father? So let's look at some basic statistics, nothing fancy, on mothers and fathers' ages. And here we have nice normal plots for both of them with the stats. And the only thing that looks a little bit unusual that you might wonder about is this sort of, instead of having a nice tail that trails off, it's cut off right here, and I think that's because I cut it off at 65. I thought the minimum mother's age would be 35, father's two, and 65 for both. Next time I'll go up to 70. All right, now here's another thing we can look at. We can obviously we think the correlation between your mother's age and your father's age would be positive. It's 0 0.75, 0 0.74. People marry the same age in the same age group, so there's nothing surprising about that. Uh, when we look at the data, we always look at uh, points that are far away from the rest. They're called outliers. These two are outliers. And we want to examine them because sometimes they're mistakes and they lower the correlation coefficient, but sometimes they're truth and we don't want to throw out real data points. So we would say, okay, one student says the mother, her mother is, his or her mother is 60 and her father is 35. <laughs> Huh, I'm gonna leave that one in. I think that's very reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. And so this one too, 61 and 38. I'm, we're gonna leave those two in. Okay, so now we wanna separate the causes from the confounders, from lurking variables that might be the true causes in observational data. All we know is two things are associated, we can't tell what's causing what. So sometimes we can do this with our own data because we have a lot of knowledge about it. So let's go back to our survey. And one of the questions that we can examine is how many pairs of shoes do you own? This is always a fun question. And here is the histogram. 1,046 students, big class, answered this uh, question. And the first thing that pops out at you are all those spikes. Why are there so many spikes? Um, it's not periodic data. You didn't see that in the ages. But then you look at the spikes and you see they're 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 50, and 50. So people are doing what? Um, uh, yeah, around. Uh, estimating. They're not going to a closet. Whereas that doesn't happen with mother's ages and father's ages because they know them exactly. Okay. So now, whoops. So now you might think this is all the men and women together. What happens if we split the data? Do you think they're going to have a similar pattern? Do you think they're going to have the same averages? No way. Let's look. Look at the huge difference. These are the women with an average of almost 20, men with an average of 7. Hugely different. Women have so many more shoes than men. So many. Here's somebody with 100 shoes. Okay. 
our own Imelda Marcus. So now, I thought, well, what does it correlate with? The number of pairs of shoes you have, most of the things, certainly it doesn't correlate with sleep. Completely flat line. But now, I was playing around, I saw that it correlated with the more bigger your foot, the bigger your foot, the fewer pairs of shoes you own. There's a negative correlation there. I started thinking, why would that be? Do big shoes cost more? Do they pay, but you have to pay, do they cost more? No, so that could be it. What, what is it? Guys have big feet. Guys have big feet and? Guys buy shoes. And buy guys buy fewer shoes, very good. So that's way down here. And women have smaller feet and buy more shoes. So how would you test whether that's true? That's the confounding factor. What do you think you would do? You'd separate the guys from the girls. Exactly. So let's do that. And when you do that, you see that there's a completely flat line there. So we confirm what he said very good. That there's no, among the guys, the shoe size has no correlation completely to how many pairs you own. Same with girls. All right, now let's look. This is one of my favorite things to do, is to do randomized surveys. To do our own experiments to give different students randomly different questions on the surveys. You can't do that on exams because some questions would be hard at times. But on the surveys, they're just fun things. So here's what we're doing right now, or we did last semester. On a scale of one to five, this was one question from our last survey, how strongly do you favor the death penalty for a person convicted of murder? And they rate from one, which is strongly opposed, all the way to five, strongly favored. Half the people get this, randomly, and the other half get this picture. And so, uh, when you look at the results, we got a 3.3 difference, okay? 543 people took the survey, and we got a difference of 0.3. In the direction we were expecting, the menacing guy, people, when they saw him, they did favor him. But the question is, is that 0.3, is that is always the question that you're gonna encounter in statistics, is that large enough difference that we can distinguish it from chance variation. I mean, you're always going to see some difference just due to the luck of the draw. Let's say there's no effect from the pictures. Let's say we didn't even show them pictures. We just asked them to rate the death penalty. 540 people just rate how strongly you feel about the death penalty. And they'd have a number from 1 to 5. And we shook up those 543 numbers in a box, drew out the first 270, and we got an average of 2.9. And of course, then the ones remaining in the box had an average of 2.6. Would that freak us out and think, that's so unlikely? Could that happen just by the luck of the draw? Having nothing to do with pictures or not? Um, what do you think? So do you think 0.3 is small enough that doesn't overwhelm you, that that easily could be due to chance variation? Raise your hand if you think so, just intuitively. Okay, <coughs> raise your hand if you think that 0.3 is way too big then it has to be due to, to um, or raise your hand if you just don't know. So we're split all over the place. And <coughs> it turns out that point 0.3 has a z-score of 2.7, so there's about a, in a one-tailed test, there's about a less than a 1% chance, like a 0.6% chance that this would happen just by the luck of the draw. So our intuitive feelings about statistics are not well developed. Mine certainly aren't. I mean, I, it's difficult. Even after doing this for years, for some reason, I still have a very, I retain a very uh, naive point of view until I actually do the statistics. Even though I've seen this over and over and over again, I can sort of tell. My gut level feeling is always a little bit of a surprise. Um, so here's another, let's try some experiment on ourselves. And on the next slide, you'll see a set of numbers. As soon as you see them, I just want you to randomly choose one. Them. Keep it to yourself. You'll only see them for a second, okay? So go ahead. All right, so everybody randomly, everybody saw them, randomly chose them. Okay, so how many people chose the number one? Raise your hand. How many people chose the number three? Raise your hands. <laughs> okay, how many people chose the number two? And how many people chose the number four? 
This is very typical, and it illustrates, I mean, in any crowd when you do this, this is very typical, and it illustrates two very important statistical ideas. One is the difference between what we mean by the colloquial meaning, of people are always saying, oh, it's a random meaning, it's haphazard, and the other is the statistical definition of random, which is very uh, precise. And in this case, it would mean that we wanted every number to have an equal chance of being chosen. They're wildly different. And the reason is because we have, it also is the <coughs> second point that's extremely important, that how we have systematic preferences, you can call them biases, that we may not even be aware of. We might not have known you were appropriate in any one. They can govern our choices. And then we have to be very careful, so randomization is a way to avoid that. Could this be related to personality anywhere? To, uh, to personality? Yeah, what, what, where do you think it's related to personality? I don't know, one four may be more extreme, two and three may be a little more middle ground. So maybe people who are a little more middle ground may select two and three versus, let's say, one and four. That's true, but two wasn't, two wasn't very... No, no, I'm just saying, I'm, no. I'm not sure if you went with another broad population. But no, but I think you're right, because I think that, like, when we, we ask the students, one through ten, pick a random number. Do you want to guess what they overwhelmingly say? Seven. 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 Yeah. Seven. So you might be right because the extremes are out, yeah. and then even numbers somehow don't seem random. <laughs> they couldn't be random. So what do we have left? Five can't be random because it's right in the middle. So we're left with seven. You left with eight. But what I'm saying is we can do experiments on this further. We could. We can do that. Some people theorize it was the shape of the three. Some people also think the three has some kind of iconic. Meaning in so many cultures, you know, Trinity. Sometimes so many very lucky numbers. So you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really interesting psychological question that we could explore by changing up this, or maybe it's the order you put them in. So you're saying we put three first, and then put one and two, and it might not. We might change things. Yeah. Are you a psychologist? No, I'm not. I have a PhD though. <laughs> Okay, so, um, and then the last thing, um, I'm going to let Jack in my tech TA for many semesters, is going to uh, present this last thing. So the number one piece of feedback that we get from STAT 100 graduates is that they never read the newspaper the same way again. So we see headlines like this every single day where new studies come out and it seems like reporters jump to the press before they even read the study. And so what most Americans do is they see this, they post it on their Facebook, they change their diet, they change their sleep pattern, they jump to these conclusions and they assume that these, these associations to be causation. And there's a common mix-up between even just some of the smartest people in America, the ones that we put the most trust in, reporters of all people, have very little understanding of basic statistics. So, STAT 100 students, if we see a headline like this, watching TV makes you die sooner, being fat actually makes you dumber, statistics show eating ice cream causes murder, right? So STAT, STAT 100 students are going to skip the Facebook and they're going to go into the article and look at the experimental design. They're going to look for that keyword random and see if it was properly used. They're going to look and see if there were other confounding variables that were not controlled for. And those are the most important things about statistics that our STAT 100 students seem to do better than the majority of the people that we put most of our trust in as, as the, uh, you know, the intelligent people of America. So uh, let's just look at one of these. Uh, statistics show that eating ice cream actually causes murder, and this is true. And we look at data that ranges from January to December, and we look at ice cream sales, it matches up perfectly with murder, with murder rates in America. And so, uh, you know, while somebody at MSN might jump uh, to the headline and say, stop eating ice cream and stop killing each other, what, what would stat 100 think, uh, students think about? So is there another confounding variable that you can think of that would associate with both eating ice cream and murder? The weather. The weather. What about the weather? It's hot. It's hot. People eat ice cream when it's hot. And the heat kind of makes people go a little stir crazy, right? The murder rates are highest in the summer. The crime in general is highest in the summer, whether it's the human activity, much more interaction than you would have, say, uh, during our uh, polar blast of a winter that we just had right now. So that's what we try and lead with our STAT 100 students, because we know that you're not going to become statisticians, at least not all of you. But we know that in whatever area of work that you're doing, you will encounter statistics. And you are going to have to prove, you're, you're going to have to be smart enough to, uh, to basically outsmart the data that you're being given and be able to sort between causation and just 
uh, association or correlation, right? So that's what we try and leave with our STAT 100 students in whatever area of work that you go into. We hope that you remember some of these key foundations from this class and the broader foundations that you gained in the School of Liberal, Liberal Arts and Science.